Hello and welcome to Columbus Local Podcast. I'm Len D'Amico and this is episode number 86. Tonight, it is my great pleasure to uh, have Linda Dactyl. Linda, how are you? Well, I'm fine, Len. Thanks for inviting me on the show. Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm really glad you guys were able to come here together. Carrie's here as well. Um, we're going to, uh, yes, folks, we are going to have a Carrie Dactyl uh, episode that'll probably be in December of 2024 or so, somewhere around there. But today we're going to focus on Linda Dactyl. Linda, you know, your name is big in Columbus, Ohio, uh, with music. There's so much that you've done. And um, I'm sure there's a lot of folks like myself that are interested in the, the person behind behind the name and, and when we see your performances it's just just a wonderful experience um, I'd like to hear from your your words how you describe yourself uh, as as part of the the music community in Columbus Ohio well thanks um, I've always been pretty eclectic in my tastes and and my interests um, you know I would say that probably most people know me as a jazz organist and then uh, I also am a drummer. I play with the Roxy Janes, that's a nice group, with uh, Kay Harris, Gayla Smith, Molly Palkin, and Mary Hoff. And then, you know, my jazz uh, organ things with uh, Carrie on drums and Don Hales on guitar. That's the core of the group with Mark Donovan on sax. Now, those are the working groups. But, uh, you know, as far as, you know, my uh, interest in progressive rock, this has been pretty much a lifetime thing and uh, you know that's uh, you know kind of what we're focused on tonight more of that with the release of the Waves of Change CD but uh, yeah that, that's been a labor of love kind of thing for me probably ever since I decided to even study music seriously as a middle school person and uh, so you've had your eye on on this type of a project or this type of a release yes your whole life and here it is yeah pretty much and and a lot of false starts and uh well you know the thing the thing is is that uh you know i first heard this music uh when my parents were playing cards with a, another couple and the, and there was an older uh they had a, a daughter was a little bit older that you know kind of had to put up with uh, not quite babysitting us but uh, she had a new stereo and she bought she was showing me her records and I said well I've seen this one here and well you want to listen to it it was yes is fragile oh geez and so she put that on and uh, you know the thing is it's like yeah I heard a couple songs on the radio and it was like I was just sitting there intrigued and she started apologizing for, well, I'm sorry, these songs are so long. I said, oh, no, no, no. I said, it's fine, it's fine. And that was really kind of the catalyst for the whole thing, was just that, you know, little per chance thing that happened where she played that record album. And, and what, what an album to uh, get indoctrinated, you know, or at least baptized in, into uh, progressive rock. That is, yeah. that's one of my favorite all-time albums. Yeah, it's still one of mine, too. Man. That's cool. That's a cool story. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of how that started. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, with that album, I, you know, I, right away I said to my folks, I said, oh, you know, can I, can you buy this for me? And so, you know, I sat there and I read the liner notes and... and the artwork too, man. Right. Wow, the mind just goes. It and really I'm, does, listening to that stuff. Well, a music teacher, I went in and I said, I don't know what these things are, you know, that Rick Wakeman was playing. I said, I, I don't know what a moog is, and, which is the wrong pronunciation, moog. I mean, I've heard different things. And he gave me a switched on Bach album to listen to. He said, well, if you really want to know about that synthesizer, he gave me his record album to listen to. So, you know, it's just little things really kind of far apart from each other. But that's really where it started. That's really me. cool. Really yeah. cool. And for, for Waves of Change then, you know, it's been incubating all these years, the concept. Um, and this is your latest. Yes, it is. Works. Um, when, when did you, I know you started, you know, with that, but like when did it actually start to come together and uh, 
regard to material and then assembling the, the process of, of the production. I know that's going to be a long story, probably, because this is quite a body of work. Well, thank you. And it's okay, right? You can use as much time as you want. Okay, well, it, basically, around the... Uh, okay, I got on the Internet in 1996, and the first two things that I looked for were people that had interest in progressive rock and jazz organ. And uh, I found those right away. And also, I... Uh, you know, just I, I wanted to put together a group and that, and it was nice to find people that had interest. Now, at that time, I didn't put a group together yet, but I started to think about, well, how how would I do this? And uh, I went back to listen to Yes, of course, but very early stuff. I noticed that Yes had uh, reworked a lot of covers before they were ever famous, like... Uh, West Side Story Tonight. There were a couple of pieces on their first two albums, like uh, uh, they seemed to like the cover, you know, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, or you know, whatever. There was uh, Steve, uh, Stephen Stills thing, and right. and then Vanilla Fudge were doing the same thing, which is a group I discovered way after the fact. I mean, reworked covers, and the other was very, ver very early versions of Deep Purple before even uh, Ian Gillen and Roger Glover were in the band, they'd cover things like Hey Joe, but it'd be like a 10-minute epic kind of thing. And I thought, well, you know, I want to start with that. And so I started working with some covers and kind of trying to overblow them, so to speak. You know, because, uh, you know, original music is a difficult thing. And, and I've always thought as a marketing thing, and it's, and it's very sincere, it's not, you know, a ploy. But, you know, let me take some works that are, you know, just let me see what I can do with arrangements with them in addition to original music. And that's kind of how it started. And I put together a band in 99 called Logarithm. And... Uh, my front person at that time, Kevin Ryan, who uh, I taught with at Bishop Hartley High School, he uh, came up with that, you know, like, you know, it was a play on the mathematic thing, and we misspelled it on purpose, That's cool. you know, and, yep. and that band lasted about two years, and uh, it was just, they're very high-maintenance band, and it's not a personality thing, it's just the music, you just have to just work, work yeah. yeah, and work, and work, and work. And so when that project, you know, went away, yeah, you know, I just went on and did other things for several years, and then um, thought about it probably to try something again. I'm trying to think about what year that would have been, maybe 2012 or 13, and you know, started to put that back together uh, with all different people, and that and that group had a, a that was called E Skip, and that had a that had a shelf life of maybe four years that was basically concluded when Dave Williams died suddenly of a heart attack. And I just decided enough of that. And so oh, I shelved sorry, that. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, Dave was a really great guy. And he was one of the main writers in that particular band. And so, you know, just let that lay dormant, you know. And, and uh, then when the lockdowns, you know, in 2020 happened, it's like, well, I've got all this time on my hands. And uh, so that's when I started to take a look at some of the older things that we had done, like uh, the Beatles uh, being for the benefit of Mr. Kite was from the logarithm days from 99. And let's see, the uh, there was two covers on there that I could never convince anybody to play. Okay, and one of them was that uh, Spanky and our gang like to get to know you. <laughs> and the other one was Some Velvet Morning, which uh, the my version of it is uh, kind of taking Vanilla Fudge and the Nancy Sinatra, Lee Hazelwood, and putting my own spin on it, too. But, you know, I never could get anybody interested in doing either one of those tunes in, in those groups, you know, prior. Right. And then I picked up the fourth cover just because I wanted to do something that was uh, historic concerning the Mellotron. That's uh, Graham Bond's uh, Baby, You Know It's True. A very pretty song, too. And 
I'm surprised that uh, I couldn't find any covers of it except for some Danish group on a TV show from the 70s. And, uh, you know, so that was my choice for the covers. You know, to something familiar. That one's more of a, a historic thing for the Mellotron. And, uh, oh, you know, the, and then the other compositions, um, I'm trying to think. Waves of Change was one that was in kind of a working uh, thing. We had had recorded a significant demo of it and uh, decided to keep the drum and bass tracks and and my keyboard tracks from that time and then uh, let's see Rising Sun was one that I wrote finished during the pandemic and uh, let's see what else here oh Redemption was just a short piece that you know had been kind of in a you know, it had been in some kind of state with the East Skip Band, but it really wasn't f quite finished. And then the Turmoils of the Soul goes all the way back to uh, when I was in grad school. It was uh, originally an origin uh, a uh, instrumental piece, uh, and then I, you know, then I decided, well, it needs to be a vocal piece. And that's one of the things where I really stretched myself on stuff was I've never been much of a lyricist and I just decided that it's like well I'm just gonna do it I tried some co-writing things with different people and you know we got some nice things but it was never we never quite gelled you know so I just decided to DIY on this or however you say it uh, do it yourself DIY you wrote, you wrote the, the lyrics yeah I did I I did and and, and that was uh, for me to write music you know it, I don't want to say it's easy but that's a lot easier for me uh, I lyrics you know for me and you find out too you know after you've written the lyrics why well, are they actually singable you know I mean you know I'm just talking more from a you know certain vowels certain consonants it's like you know, those are the kind of things that you don't even think about. And I don't know if, you know, people really do think about it, but it's like, well, well, you know, I probably should change this word here because it's not working out, it's not sounding right, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't really have a method for that, but, uh, you know, the music part of it, that came a lot easier for me. How does that come for you, though? Well, generally, it's uh, kind of a thing where... I really like chords and harmony. So I'll sit around on the piano or the guitar, mostly the piano or, you know, synths, and come up with a nice chord progression and record it. And if that's all I get, you know, like maybe four or eight bars, just document it and come back to it later. And, you know, just keep building on top of that. I don't really have a method for it. But, uh, you know, what, what I found is that I can, uh, you know, just take these little snippets. And then, and then that's where my music education comes in. I, I, I'm very schooled. I have a master's degree in music. But that doesn't mean anything unless you can play, you know, or create. I mean, that's where I'm and, at. And assemble and arrange, right? Exactly. And that's where it's very Com helpful. Compose. Yeah, for me, it's like... I always say this, and I've taught at the college level too, and you know, I don't know if people like this or not, but I learned equally from the ivory tower and the garage. Because, you know, I learned a lot of things from musicians that, you know, if I even put a chord sheet in front of them, they'd be like, well, you know, I really don't read music, but, you know, they might play something on the guitar, and it's like, well, can you tell me what that chord is? I remember, for instance, years ago when I was playing in a cover band. Uh, let's see, who was in that group? Okay, well, most of those people moved out of town and they aren't playing anymore. But anyway, the guy was like playing that Stormy Monday riff on the guitar, like the Allman Brothers, and it was like, ooh, I really like that sound. I said, can, can you tell me what you're playing there? He says, well, I really don't know. I got this, and he, he showed me the chord shape, and... Then I, you know, tried to grab the notes on the piano. Yeah, yeah, just stuff like that, you know. Yeah. And, you know, I've sure milked that riff for <laughs> years. <laughs> 
you know, and, you know, so it, it's been that way, you know, like if I didn't understand something. And, you know, I, I just learned, I learned from props, I learned from the garage. I mean, and I think it's all, it all, you it's know. It's all experiences that blend. That's right. Uh, and they all are meaningful. They're, for, they're waves, right? Exactly. There kinda, you go. That's kind of how it uh, strikes, you know, the, the name of your, your work, Waves of Change. Um, so you had, you had the music first and you ended up, you were right. You wrote the lyrics to the songs. Right. Well, here, here's the process that I used. Okay. And, uh, this goes back, uh, to when I did my second organ album with Tony Monaco, uh, producing, okay. And engineering. He said, you know, Linda, you play drums too. He said, that'd be something, you know, it, but I, he said, I don't know how we would do that. And so I kind of made a note of that. That was about 2008. And and when I ended up recording the one 2015, a late one, was like, you know, I think I know how to do this now. And I decided to do a tribute to Cozy Cole, Topsy. I knew Cozy. I went to Capital University, and he was actually a student there. He wanted to legitimately get a degree. And uh, one of the... Uh, weird things was sitting there in jazz history class beside Cozy Cole, who actually was jazz history. <laughs> so he was sitting there taking the class. Vaughn oh, Weister was the instructor of that. But, you know, he came and took all the tests, and, and he was just a wonderful guy. So I thought, well, if I'm going to do a drum piece, I, I like Sing, 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 the Benny Goodman thing, but I thought, yeah, that, that, that really isn't what... So, Topsy, I decided to, you know, take a look at the old recordings that uh, Cozy had done. And then basically what I did was I transcribed it, and that took quite a while. Uh, you know, just orally doing that probably took a couple of weeks of me, you know, messing with it a couple hours a day. And then I sequenced it into a finale as I was writing the parts. And and then what we ended up doing was I took those horrible sounding MIDI files, fed them downstairs to our studio to Carrie, and Carrie and I sat there and laid the drum tracks um, first, erased the crappy thing, and then just had the musicians come in uh, one by one. I, I did my organ parts next, and then Don the guitar, and then we brought the horns all in. This is at your home, your at, home studio? Uh, my home studio, yeah. Uh, Pterodactyl Productions, you know. And, you know, Carrie's had everything in there from a big band to a cello quartet that wanted to get gigs for wedding receptions, you yeah. know. And yeah. Teeny Tucker has uh, recorded there a number of times. I think three of her releases, maybe four. Um, you know, our... Re Five Carrie's saying. Five, Okay. So yeah, I you know can't keep track of that, uh, all that stuff, and you know just different things. Uh, but, but anyway, so I so we built that Topsy track up, in and in, in in that regard, and it has relevance for the new CD because that's how I did everything. Okay, it, it's like uh, with the exception of, uh, as far as the musicians on this, it's kind of uh, well Charles Valentino sings all the lead vocals. Uh, Carrie plays drums or orchestral percussion or marimba on most of them. I play drums on three of them, and I did uh, all the keyboard work, some, uh, you know, atmospheric guitar. A and uh, let's see what else, the background vocals. I did a f couple of lead lines on some of the things on the singing, uh, which was kind of a new thing for me too. And then the rest of the group, is people from Honk, Whale, and Moan. Uh, Larry Marotta on guitar, and Steve Paracas on bass, and then Mark Donovan on tenor sax. I just have one, uh, one tune on there with horn. And, you know, I just basically, what I did since they all read, okay, I had like put this together on the sequencer, and I had to write out parts. I wrote everything out on finale, and then it's like, okay, uh, you know, we're going to do this tune. 
And then, uh, you know, Carrie and Steve and I did some bed tracks, you know, just to get the bass and drums down for a couple of them. But some of them just went, you know, I just sent them downstairs from my computer to Carrie's and we did the drums first, erased the crappy drum machine thing I had on there and just build it up from that. And I actually learned how to do that from having done that Topsy thing. That's why I t uh, s mentioned the Topsy story because nice. that's how I learned how to do that. And frankly, it's a really great way to do things, even though it's tedious, but I didn't have to re rehearse a band for you know, six months to a year to do stuff like this, which you know, that might take that, you know, just, uh, you know, with people only being available maybe once or twice a week and, right. you know, and it's like, hey, you know, here's the sheet music and, and here's your payment for this, work for hire. And, you know, it was just, it just went by, you know, much smoother than me trying to do this, starting with a band. Although, you know, the band thing, if we could all live together in a firehouse and, and you know, and, and and this kind of thing, you know, maybe that could like yes, <laughs> Over did the or winter, whatever. Making stew, exactly. Yeah. But you know, that's fun. kind of not the way it works now. No, so. no. But it's interesting how that came about for you. And you mentioned Charles Valentino. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was a find. He. Uh, how did you come? Yeah, yeah. You know, and you chose him to to sing this this uh, this album, every track, right? Yes, he he's all lead on that, uh, and uh, I. Uh, well, the thing is, is that that was the last thing that I did. Okay, who am I going to get to sing? I got all the musicians, and uh, Carrie was involved with a, uh, oh, a, a Jesus Christ superstar uh, thing that uh, Stacy Anagnostis and Rob put together, and uh, I was just I wasn't involved in that. But I was upstairs listening to the rehearsals, and I thought, well, who, who's singing Judas's parts down there? <laughs> who is that guy? And it was like... In your own house. That's right. right. I know, man. Yeah, he was up there just screaming like Ian Gillen, and it was like, okay, well, you know, I just made a mental note of it. And then, you know, Charles agreed to do it, and uh, it turned out very well. It did. I, I've heard uh, several of these tracks, and it's just really, you know, there's 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 a couple of uh, emotional uh, hitting male singers that you know affect mm -hmm. me that way. Uh, Pavarotti's one of them, and Charles Valentino is another one of those because he he can actually make me, you know, emotional mm -hmm. with his uh, with his performance. You know, he has he has that that thing that that gave you pause to make the mental note well you know <laughs> one of the things and uh pete falico from uh san jose he's a npr dj out there and he runs the doodlin lounge which uh that, that goes all the way back to when i signed on the internet because i've known pete that long um, Pete did a very nice web page on Hank Marr, a uh, B3 legend here from Columbus, and I studied with him, and that's how I got in touch with Pete. But you know, Pete, in the liner notes, he, he, he did talk about you need to let your emotions sw sweep you away with this music, and he compared it some to, like, theater and those kinds of things. And, uh, you know, so, you know, Pete picked up on that, totally being a part from anything in the process you know pete's known me for years and and uh tony monaco also who uh you know tony i was so happy when tony agreed to have this on uh the album because mostly his chicken coop records is uh more of a jazz organ label although he's had some other people on there that were a little more into fusion so that was probably a little bit of a stretch but, uh, you know, it was no problem. And I'm glad because I didn't have to, you know, shop labels that I didn't know. So Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> the, rest of, the rest of the players that you have um, that, that recorded on Waves of Change, have, have, you, have you known them over the years? How, how have they intertwined with, with your association? Okay, well, I'm married to Carrie. Yep. 
<laughs> There's one there. He's over there shaking his head like big deal. It's a, it's a big deal, man. It yeah. is. It is. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, yeah, we... Uh, your <laughs> But, uh, you know, uh, as far as uh, other than Charles, okay, because Charles is, uh, you know, uh, newer in, you know, my friend circle. But... Uh, Steve Parakis, Larry Marota, and Mark Donovan. I've some big names. played with Columbus. them and Honk, Whale, and Moan. And, and Mark plays in my quartet, uh, plays tenor and, uh, you know, different woodwinds in the organ group. So, you know, that, that's a long period of time. You know, Steve, I met when I was in grad school at Ohio State. But I, we didn't really work together then, but we just kind of knew each other. And then, you know, I met Larry and Mark later. But, you know, Steve asked me to join Honk, Whale, and Moan. I'm trying to think what year that was. Um, well, I got pictures of me wearing a kimono, playing the Hammond B3 down at Comfest. It, I would say probably early 2000s. I know that group's been around since, uh, I think, 91 is what uh, Steve said. And, you know, there's been heartache in that band. I mean, we lost... Uh, our main writer, Brian Casey, in 2008. He was the delightful guy and very creative. And I didn't know, uh, uh, I think, is it Mark Henderson? I, I did not know him, but uh, you know, he was one of the alums of Honk, Whale, and Moan that passed, too. And the, uh, the group's active, you know, and that, and that's always fun. You know, it's, uh, you know, it, it just is. And, uh, you know, the, that's how I got to know uh, you know, Steve and Larry, mostly, and then Mark, you know, just different things. I mean, we had worked, uh, you know, some musical theater, pit orchestra kind of things locally here, and, you know, it's just a, it's a big network, you know. There's a lot of people here in town that I don't know, but, you know, most of the times, you know, it's, what's that funny saying about, you know, you're five people away from, from knowing everybody. Word of mouth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you work you work with some great, great musicians. Yeah, I've had on a regular basis. You know, know, some of the I'd say as far as, you know, you know, my college teachers, I mean, I certainly need to recognize them. Bob Brighthop from Capital University, uh Jim Curlis, I studied with at Ohio State talking on the drum thing, Doctor James L. Moore, late Dr. Moore, Dave Wheeler, uh, where I learned pretty much how to orchestrate. He, he was kind of a, the jazz ed uh, guru here in town forever. Uh, Hank Marr, um, you know, some other, you know, some other names. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure where I was going with that. But uh, what, what, honey? Gene. Gene, Gene. Walker, yes. Yeah. Gene Walker. Yeah, I certainly don't want to forget Gene, and, and, you know, that's just thinking on the top of my head. But, uh, you know, Gene, I worked with Gene, well, pretty much um, from 04 until he passed. Uh, I mean, Gene did not play maybe most of the last year that he lived. But I basically got to know Gene. I mean, Tony Monaco had mentioned that. But what really happened was when Hank Marr died in 04, I was approached by Dan Thomas, who used to work uh, quite a bit on the committee of hot times, okay? And uh, he's a very gregarious fella, and uh, he used to do some uh, radio announcing work, I think WCRS, I'm not sure. But anyway, Dan heard me play probably with Honk, Whale, and Moan at ComFest, and he says, well, you know, Hank's gone, and he's like, we need somebody to take over that jam. And I said, well, wait a minute. I said, uh, for Hank Marr? And, and he's like, yeah, yeah. He said, you can do that and whatever. And I'm like, I really had only been playing the organ in that context for probably about four years. I mean, I took organ lessons since I was a kid, but, you know, that was more playing Oh, I don't know what you'd say, theater organ style or more supper club. It, it wasn't jazz, you know, and I kind of dug into that in the late 90s. But, you know, at, at that point, you know, it had only been four or five years. And, uh, 
you know, Gene, I knew Gene. Uh, I had played a gig or two with him as a drummer. Uh, it's funny because we concurrently were students at Ohio State together. You know, Gene went back to get his bachelor's degree. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think Gene thought, well, who's this kid, you know, wanting to horn in on this thing at first? And, and but, but, you know, it was a thing where, you know, when we got together, he, he said to me, he said, why do you want to play, Linda? And I said, all the things you are. And he said, you know, after we played the tune, he said, he said, I know, how did he put it? He said, I'm glad you called that tune because he said, I use that tune to cut people off the bandstand at jams. And, you know, but, but all in, you know, friendly and stuff. And, right. but, but it was kind of a thing where it's like, you know, Dan really put us together. And, uh, but then, you know, it ended up being a very, very nice work relationship for, uh, you know, for almost 10 years. And it was nice from the beginning, but, you know, Gene didn't, I think Gene didn't know if I could play or not was basically what it was. And, you know, here it is, you know, trying to step in, you know, and to, for Hank Marr. I mean, I was actually like, you know, I don't know if I can do this, you know, but it ended up, it ended up being very fruitful and uh, very satisfying. Where was that? Was that that was the Hot Times Jam? Gotcha. Uh, yeah, it's like I think that I don't know the total history, but I think that Hank and uh, Rusty Bryant maybe started that. And uh, I remember you know going to the Anchor Inn jams uh, that Rusty and Hank ran back in the. Mm, it was probably the early 80s was when that started kind of date myself on that I guess by saying that but uh, um, anyway um, you know a bunch of us college kids we'd go out there and, and Hank would always let us play and uh, yeah I mean that was the point of it actually and I think Rusty and Hank started that now if that's not true I'm sure I'll be corrected and then uh, Gene got involved with it and then you know and then that went on for years with Hank and Gene running it. And then you know, when Hank passed, then, you know, I came in, you know, and played organ for that. And, uh, and for how long did that last for you? Okay, uh, let's see here. Not quite 10 years. That's, that's yeah. longevity. Yeah, not quite 10 years. And uh, you know, it was always very enjoyable. And I know when Gene died, they asked me if I wanted to take it over. I said no. I mean, I just thought, you know, that I, I wanted to leave that alone. Now, I know that they do have something going on with that, but uh, I just kind of felt like, you know, after Gene passed that I just kind of wanted to do something else, you know. What did that end up being for you? What do you mean? The, the, the moving on. Where'd, where'd you move into from there? Okay, well... Like, generally. Well, you know, Gene passed in 2014. Oh, so, yeah. so so basically, well, th this actually leads to something else, okay? Uh, you know, Gene was very popular here in town and, and all over. I mean, you know, ev he played with every organ player except Jimmy Smith. And he used to tell me that uh, when Jimmy Smith would come to town... He liked his mother's cooking so much that Jimmy'd come over to the house and have dinner. <laughs> but I don't know why they never played together, but you know, he played with I McGriff could... and all these, I mean, all these big names. I could, just a laundry list of names of uh, jazz organists. Yes. But uh, see, where was I going with that? Oh yeah, okay. So anyway, when Gene died, you know, there was a, a regular church service and such. But they put together a, uh, a memorial uh, show for him at the Lincoln. Okay. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a thing that, you know, I figured that, you know, everybody and their brother would want to play it. And, and I remember talking to one of the organizers. I said, look, you know, I said, I'd like to do something. But, you know, if there isn't room, that's okay, too. I mean, you know, Gene was a friend. And it was like, I mean... It was just a thing where it's like if there's room for us to play, that's fine. And if there's not, I won't be offended. Okay. Right. So anyway, uh, Ted McDaniel uh, put us carrying me together with Don Hales. Okay. And, and I had known Don, but not well. You know, uh, he had played with uh, Tony Monaco for years. And Don's got a resume like you wouldn't believe. I mean, every 
everybody from Bill Doggett of the Honky Tonk fame to Eddie Harris and so on and so forth. But uh, they decided to put Don on uh, with us, and and we played all the things you are, you know, with you know, just because of the significance with Gene and my history on that. And uh, we did not have a sax player. I said, I want a sax player. Not not for that. And that's how that started. And so then, you know, Don and Carrie and I, you know, basically have been, you know, doing this since uh, for 10, well, where are we at? 2024 to 10 years. And, uh, you know, still going. We're playing the Italian Festival on Friday. That's right. I thought I saw that name. Yeah. So, uh, and, and with Mark Donovan on sax and, and Don and Carrie and I, 530 up there. But, you know, when it depends whenever you listen to this podcast, but that's current right <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah. So, from today. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's quite a, um, an array of influences in Columbus. You know, have you always been in Columbus, Linda? No, I, I grew up in, uh, Holmes County, which is in the middle of Amish country. I actually grew up outside of a little town called Berlin, Ohio, not Berlin. I guess they changed the pronunciation during the first world war or whatever little place called Bunker Hill Village. Wow. And, uh, you know, my, uh, my father, uh, passed in 2020 and, uh, my mother's doing well, but they ran a cheese business up there. Uh, dad is, uh, was an immigrant from Bern, Switzerland, outside of Bern, came over here as a young child with his uh, parents and sister. And, uh, they were involved in the cheese business and they still are. And, uh, so I grew up there you know, kind of in the middle of nowhere and, uh, and, you know, just had interest in music and stuff. And then I came to college, Capital University, and I pretty much stayed. I, I did live out in the Dayton area, um, you know, uh, with my first teaching job, but, you know, I decided to come back here and go to grad school. And I've always, I've always liked Columbus. I mean, I don't, yeah, I think we have a pretty good thing happening here with the music, particularly in the jazz and you know, original and whatever. I mean, I've never been hurting for work. No, you haven't. And your name's everywhere. What are some of the 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 ones that kind of highlight in your mind over you know the time where you've you've been asked to perform in uh, maybe an event mm -hmm. um, that we may not have known was you. Well, I'd have to give that some thought. Um, hmm. Let me think about that that's for a okay. second. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, that's all right. <laughs> oh, I don't know. You mean you, like you uh, ever special play, things? You ever you ever play at a ball game? You ever play organ at a um, at an event? Um, you know, a church or anything like that? Yeah, I've done some of that. Um, you know, as as far as significant events. Um, Probably one of the ones that will always stand out to me, and this is on the jazz organ side of things, sure. is um, I was introduced to Trudy Pitts from, New, uh, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and she was one of the, uh, you know, one of the uh, legendary B3 players. I mean, it, playing the B3 is, uh, you know, it's kind of like, you know, this, this whole... Uh, community of people like like all the bassoon players in the United States I mean you know people know each other in right. the circles uh, you know some of the names may not be as familiar if you're not particularly into jazz and then in the organ stuff but I was introduced to Trudy Pitts by a woman in uh, Florida named uh, Joan Cartwright and she did uh, podcast interviews and she decided to do uh, one on female organists and she asked me, would you like to be on this with Trudy Pitts? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> mm, wait, wait a minute. Uh, you know, it was shocking, actually. And uh, I remember telling Joan, I said, um, I said, if Trudy and I hit it off, I said, I'd like to maybe 
try to put together something playing with her. Like they call them jazz organ summits, and it's basically, you know, it's not like a boxing match kind of deal. But you know, it's like uh, you know, you have a concert, and then you know, you don't compete against each other. But but you know, it's it's kind of a thing, you know, where you know, there's a lot of organ music going on. And what happened was, you know, Trudy and I really hit it off, and we got to be good friends. I mean, we just, and it wasn't me being the fangirl, oh, I'm talking to Trudy, and <laughs> la, la, la. You kind of were. Right? Yeah, I kinda. was. But, but but we got to know but, each other, you know. That, that's so awesome. Yeah, and it, and it was. And then I told Gene Walker about this. I said, you know, keep us under wraps. I said, you know, Trudy and I, I mean, not that I was friends with Trudy, but we've been talking about maybe trying to do something together. Nice. And uh, he said, okay, fine. So he kind of filed that back. He talked to Dr. Ted McDaniel at Ohio State, who I knew, I knew Ted, and, and uh, a great guy, very supportive. And, and Gene said, well, you know something, why don't we bring Gloria Coleman on here? Because Gene had lived with uh, Gloria Coleman, who's a jazz organist. She's deceased too now. But uh, let's see here, and George Coleman, who's still living, tenor saxophone player, I think he's up in his 90s. Okay, so anyway, they decided uh, between Gene and Ted kind of, uh, oh, you know, putting their thoughts together, I was going to be on it, Trudy, and they brought Gloria Coleman. And I would say that that was probably one to this point probably one of the highlights because, you know, those two women really, I mean, you know, everybody, if people don't know about jazz organ, but they might know a little bit, Jimmy Smith's name will come up. Well, these people were Jimmy Smith type, I mean, of, of fame and respect. Recognized. Yeah, you know, so I was kind of thrown in with that. Well. You know, and the friendship I had with Trudy always meant an awful lot because she would just call me out of the blue. It wasn't like, you know, oh, Trudy, you know, can you teach me how to how you did this run or whatever? I mean, and she would welcome that, too. But it was really a genuine thing. Sounds like it. It, it was and very much so. And, and we had August birthdays. Uh, mine's the 8th and hers was the 10th. And we used to tease each other about that. And I came home, you know, on, you know, one of my birthdays, you know, and there's Trudy Pitts on my phone machine having, you know, sung happy birthday to me, you know, just stuff like that. And very she was cool. very spiritual too. And, you know, a, a devout Christian and, uh, you know, just a, a real person, very much so. Sounds like it. And, you know, with, with the, those experiences too, um, you know, with with jazz with jazz organ, mm -hmm. you know, are, are there are there works that that are uh, recorded f with that? Is is your your uh... oh with uh, Trudy and Gloria? Yeah, some, and I'm glad that to have this video. I on my YouTube channel, which is LDB Three Music, somebody did a tape. I mean, it's it's very homegrown, mm -hmm. but that whole show is documented. Oh wow! And what I did was. Uh, I went through instead of like putting this two hour thing up, which nobody will watch, was I took the, uh, I mean, some people would, but, but, you know, I separated all the songs, you know, so it's like, you know, however many tunes I had, you know, mine and Trudy's and Gloria's all separated out. And uh, so it is there, you know, there's enough documentation and, you know, it's, it's, it's a, uh, 2009 quality video, you know, which was fine. But you're fortunate to have it. For for sure. Yeah, definitely. No doubt about it. Um, so with B3, though, how did that enter your life? Okay. And what is B3, to, for those that may not know? Well, it's like calling a Les Paul or, you know, it's a brand kind of thing. But uh, let's see, the B3 stuff, I'm trying to think. Well, basically, the organ stuff started. My dad uh, encouraged me to take lessons, and I was about six, and uh, this Sears truck came to the house. I'm like, ooh, what's that? 
well, there's something in there for you. And it's like, oh, okay. And How cool is that? I, yeah, well, I had not even asked, you know, but I think, you know, Dad, knowing that I was kind of a squirrely kid, you know, I should probably, you know, focus something instead of, you know, just running around the house. And uh, so I learned on that organ. It was a full organ. It was small, but it had pedals. It wasn't like a little chord organ. And then I took lessons with a couple of brothers in Dover, Ohio that ran a Lowry dealership. So I had a Lowry for the next organ. And then I really liked the Hammond. And I said, well, you know, what about the Hammond? And it was like, well, you have this other organ here, but let's see if we can sell it. So they sold that organ. I think another $600 bought me my first Hammond. And uh, it didn't have all the bells and whistles. I mean, that Lowry had like a some drums on it. it. They didn't have drum machines yet. You had to actually keep time. You'd like put a bass drum on the pedal, boom, boom, and then the snare drum be on the, on the, you know, this, you know, the left hand. And, and so, you know, but B3, I mean, you know, the Hammond thing, I mean, that's the, that's the sound, you know, and, uh, the organ. Right. And that organ I have was from, uh, th this is just the quality of the instrument. And the reason why Hammond Organ probably went out of business, okay, the, the original company, all right, because they never, they never break down. Uh, the uh, B2 organ that I have, I have a B3 also, but B2 precedes that. Um, let me see here. 1951, it was dated that way by one of my techs. And just two years ago, the power amp went down. Oh. And I sent... The original? The original. Oh. I sent it up to Detroit, my tech, John Doyle. I sent it up to him. And yeah, it was nice. We could take it out. And yeah, I didn't have to drive the organ up to Detroit and, and that. And uh, I said, I want to know if there was any work done. And he said, everything was original. So that thing lasted for 70 years. <sighs> And what that's a great story. Yeah, isn't it though? <laughs> but they never needed to be replaced. No. You know, tanks. And exactly. And and you hold that around Columbus. Right. 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 Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, I'm an endorsee of the uh, Hammond XK3C, and that's the newer Hammonds. That's a digital, and they're very very nice instruments. But uh, you know, it goes into about five pieces. You know, it's manageable. You know the other one. You got to have a van. You got to have. You just have to Forklift? do it. Forklift. Well, you know. Roll, roll. How how did you guys move that around? Dollies, dollies in okay. a ramp. I mean, it, it's doable with a couple of people. So uh, I need to take a drink of water. Here. Oh sure, no problem. Yeah, so. it's no problem. Yeah, and I think um, what we'll do too is we'll um, we'll have some links to to some of your music. Um, that we'll put in the episode mm -hmm. and uh, just make sure that we have, um, you know, access to your, to your music. Okay, here we are. Yeah. How can, how can we find your music? Okay. Um, our website is www.dactyl.com. Okay, now... All of my, uh, okay, I've, I've run out of, you know, some CDs on earlier releases, but uh, that's where we can get the Waves of Change CD and also a late one. Now, as far as people that don't own these archaic CD players, all right, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on all the, you know, regular things, you know, your iTunes, Amazon, um, uh, you know, whatever. Spotify, it's out there. The only thing about Spotify on the new one, well, I, I, I don't, uh, I don't have a full subscription, so maybe full subscribers, you know, uh, are able to get right to it. Right, right. Yeah, right. That's, I, that's a, that's a, that is a rub with, uh, with the subscriptions. Yeah. And the other, the other thing too, is that the suite, uh, okay, that's a 16 minute suite. There's separation on the tracks in Spotify where, if you buy the CD, 
it it all melts no. together, right? So that that was the only thing because you know I have pointed people to Spotify and YouTube and you know that kind of thing, you know, for people to you know listen to stuff. But you know, I got plenty of CDs I'd love to sell. Be, that'd be cool. Yeah. And how many how many releases do you have? How many full CD releases oh. do you have? Okay, I have three jazz organ ones, and then this one in the progressive rock vein. We are coming out with uh, 2025, another jazz organ one. Oh, sweet. Yeah, so we oh, just man. finished recording that one within the last couple of weeks. So jazz organ, but Waves of Change is really the accumulation of ever since you were young. Yes, very the much The thoughts so. and arrangements um, coming into Waves yeah. of Change as a release. What's yeah, that, Carrie? The what? Amethyst. Oh, yeah, okay. There is another one, Amethyst Dreams, that I forgot about. Now, that was a collaboration between, uh, that, that, that's uh, year 2000. And that's, the, that's really the first commercial release, New Age Celtic. And that was a, uh, that's not me as a solo artist. That was a, a, a collaborative effort between me and Timothy Conway. Okay, and, uh, you know, he did the... Uh, you know, basically, I orchestrated his music, okay, and, uh, y you know, he came in with a bunch of lyrics, uh, he had a, uh, he, he wrote a script, and it was based on uh, Merlin the Magician, but it was a little bit more historic. Now, he hasn't gotten that staged yet, but in that collaboration that we did, we took two or three years during our leisure time in the late 90s, came up with a whole lot of music, and so we just decided to release an instrumental thing, and that was probably, I'm trying to think. Well, you know, that's a heavy synth album. Carrie played some percussion on there, but it, it's pretty much a, a synth album uh, with a 90s, a late 90s kind of sound, Amethyst Streams, but... Uh, that that's also on all the uh, streaming things. I don't have any of those for sale, you know, as far as hard copy. Gotcha. Yeah. Yep. So we'll have links to uh, your Spotify. Sure. And then uh, to uh, you know where we, where we can get more information with uh, your purchasing a CD. Sounds good. That'd be a good way to go. All right. I need to write that down for you. Or... Um, we'll get it. We'll catch it after. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Anything else you want to? Leave, leave us with in regard to thoughts and inspiration with with your music, Linda. Well, you know, I I just appreciate that that people enjoy it. I mean, I would do it anyway. I feel that it's a calling, and uh, yeah, I don't see any reason to ever stop. Just keep going and going and going from right. one thing to the right. other. And you have a 2025. We'll keep our our eyes and ears peeled for this new release too. Yes, and that one. Oh, that's jazz. That's jazz. Yeah, organ that's going to be jazz organ. Now, as far as doing any more progressive rock, I kind of have a goal of maybe three to four years. You know, another thing too. It, it, it's like, you know. It, you you have to fund these things too, and, and so you know I noticed that a lot of time had gone by since 2015. Well, we we lost two years, you know, to the you know the lockdown the stuff and yeah. and that and uh, but you know I generally you know to put something out every two to three years I think is reasonable. So it, it takes that long. It, it does. It can take even longer sometimes, you know. Um, and then again, people get themselves in those those barn homes and hang out for a winter and crank it out. There you go. You think you might pull that pull it off that way? No, oh, it's not going to happen. Probably so. not. I mean, it's I'm too much, too 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 uh, too close together. <laughs> you could do that when you're twenties, but I don't know about where where I am. I can't imagine living with some of my friends. For that oh long. yeah, that part of it. Yeah, I don't know. I love them, but ooh. Yeah, well, definitely need to have. Carrie's shaking his head now. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we we appreciate our little kitty cats. You know, that we, you know, they're the other people in our house. <laughs> Very cool. 
anything live coming up, Linda? Well, with the, your involvements. Okay, the Italian Festival. Yep. Okay, right now, for the rest of the year, it's jazz organ stuff. Well, no, that's not really true. Okay, I mean, I uh, okay, we're playing the Italian Festival on October the 11th. And I have some calendar with the Roxy Janes. That's the band I play drums with. Those are all out in the Buckeye Lake area. Okay, and I uh, I keep my Facebook updated, you okay, know, on cool. that. And then uh, we're going to finish out uh, public performance. Uh, you know, anything can come up. But uh, the first weekend of November, Dick's Den, I have a Charles Erland B3 tribute band, okay, that... Uh, will be re represented on the new CD on one number. That's a six-piece group uh, with Mark Donovan, Ben Hunt on tenor, uh, Ben Huntoon on trumpet, uh, Charles Erland alum Pat Ankrum on percussion, and then the core group of Carrie and me and Don Hales. And then, uh, and then the trio has one more date at Dick's Den. So that's what's coming up in... I keep things quite updated through uh, social media on those things. Great. So we just look at look your name, and we can we can find out what you're what you're up to. It's it's great great music. Well, thank you so much. Waves of Change is the latest progressive rock. Um, we've got a we've got a several uh, releases that we'll we'll have links to uh, for your your jazz organ and various uh, releases there. Um, Linda Dactyl, thank you so much for sharing so much about some of the insights with your your latest music and some of the in inspirations and your experiences over the years. Here as a Columbus-based musician, you know, that's definitely had so many wonderful contributions and performances and, you know, music production that, you know, we can all enjoy for a long time thanks so much well thank you for having me i really appreciate it lynn you bet all right i think carrie uh he's uh he's had this spot that that beth usually hangs out beth's traveling on business this week but you know how'd that work out for you over it's there it's <laughs> <laughs> comfortable chair yeah, it <laughs> i said i was expecting it to be hard and i like sunk in i'm like well this will work yeah it's pretty good not bad Okay, guys, um, episode number 86, Linda Dactyl. Thank you so much. Appreciate uh, Linda's time and Gary's time. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.